On behalf of Cumulus Networks, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. We will be discussing ONI, the Open Network Install Environment. Presenting today will be Kurt Bruni. He's a member of our technical staff here at Cumulus Networks. Kurt will run you through ONI. Uh, ONI was pioneered here at Cumulus Networks and is now part of the Open Compute Project. The webinar will be about 30 to 45 minutes. We'll take a brief pause to answer a few questions from the participants at the midway point and again towards the end if time permits. For those of you interested, you have the opportunity to ask questions during the webinar by using the window marked questions. Simply type in your question and click send. We'll make every effort to answer your questions during the webinar. If we are unable to answer your questions during the webinar, please check our blog, cumulusnetworks.com slash blog and we will try to have all of your questions and answers posted there. Uh, you can also tweet us your questions, and our Twitter handle is at Cumulus Network. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Kurt. Thanks for the introduction, Carrie. Uh, today we're going to be discussing ONI, the Open Network Install Environment. Uh, here's a high-level overview of the agenda. Um, we're going to show how ONI solves a real problem, cover the design approach, how ONI has been adopted in the industry, and in the latter half of the webinar, we're going to have a technical deep dive into how ONI functions and operates. Before getting to ONI, however, um, for those new to Cumulus Networks and who we are, here's a quick refresher. Um, our number one thing is that we create a product called Cumulus Linux, which is a best-of-breed distribution for network switches. We really want to uh, open up the, uh, the data center with the combination of bare metal hardware running uh, network operating systems. Uh, and ONI is a big part of how we're going to do that. We need to disaggregate the software from the hardware, and the ONI project allows bare metal switches to present a platform that is receptive to numerous operating systems. Uh, we envision a future where there's a choice everywhere. You have a choice amongst hardware platforms, a choice amongst operating systems, and a choice amongst applications. And again, ONI is a huge enabler of this type of ecosystem. When we started ONI, we wanted to make sure that it was, we wanted it to be modern and an efficient way of installing network operating systems at scale for data centers. One of the key uh, design goals within ONI it was basing it upon Linux, which allowed us to simplify many things, which we'll get into over time. Um, it also provides a, a simple way for OS vendors to build OS installers. It has wide industry support. It helps automate, automate and scale massive data centers. Uh, it enables this ecosystem of open hardware and software. And uh, recently, it has been uh, adopted by the Open Compute Project as a key enabler of uh, open compute networking. What led to ONI was a confluence of many difficulties. It was about two years ago we saw that there was all these unique hardware platforms, and it was difficult for hardware vendors to continue to tailor operating system installers for these individual hardware platforms. And so that was one difficulty. Another difficulty was that data center operators wanted to start to automate the provisioning of their networking gear at scale. And uh, the existing uh, switches and products at that time were not amenable to that uh, desire. And then also end users, they wanted a choice between hardware and software in that when you bought a product, if you didn't like the operating system, you'd like to take it off and put a different operating system on it. And when we started, that was not really possible. Um, and also we saw that Pixie, while it was okay for servers and it, it kind of solved one problem, we could do so much more with, a, with more modern technology. So before ONI, we had essentially an appliance model. OS vendors wrote platform-dependent operating system installers for a particular bare metal platform. Hardware vendors uh, were put in the position of having to install various operating systems on a single hardware platform 
thereby creating multiple SKUs from their perspective so that they could ship them off, <clears throat> ship them off to the end customers. Um, that was hard for difficult for hardware vendors to manage because they had to, uh, from their perspective, they were making hardware, not software, but yet they had to deal with all these uh, software implementation details. And then the end users were sort of stuck too. Once they got this product, uh, they were stuck with it. There was no good way to take the operating system off and install a new operating system on top of it. So when we brought ONI in, it helped to smooth out the rough edges. It allowed these things to mesh nicely. Uh, the hardware vendors are responsible for ONI. It's a, it's a small firmware that lives on the machine. So now hardware vendors can produce a product with a single hardware platform. ONI's pre-installed on it, and that's a single SKU for them. That allows them to open up distribution channels and value-added resellers who, are, who then have can deal with the problem of installing different operating systems on top. Uh, operating system vendors like Cumulus Networks um, also are now out of the installer game to a large degree. They can focus on just a nice common flat interface that ONI provides for installing an operating system on platforms. And then end users, they really win because now they can pick and choose amongst their operating systems, pick and choose amongst their hardware platforms, and, the, and they can utilize some of the key features that ONI brings to the table to help automate mega scale provisioning. And we'll get into that at the, as, we, uh, as we move along. All these things came together and it was, you know, it really blew this whole ecosystem open. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, ONI, we wanted to adopt a new approach into a, for modern data center provisioning. So we surveyed a number of people who were data center operators, system administrators, open source project leaders, and we wanted to um, you know, solicit their input about how to really create a strong project. Uh, we wanted it to be more than Pixie. We wanted, we wanted it to, while TFTP and UDP were good, we wanted IPv6, we wanted a full networking stack. We wanted to add uh, other automation and provisioning uh, utilities to the install process to help these data center operators who were trying to go at scale. Uh, we wanted it to be pre-installed by the hardware vendor and, uh, and we wanted it to be based on Linux. And this is one of the most uh, pivotal decisions we ever made because that really busts things wide open. Uh, because here we can reuse the existing networking stack of Linux. Uh, we get IPv4, IPv6. We get uh, TFTP is still supported, but we also have things like nearest neighbor discovery with IPv6, DHCP. A lot of things come not really for free, but a lot more easily than they would when you go down the, uh, the Pixie route. We also tied together the, uh, the BusyBox command line environment. So People who were familiar with Linux would, would grasp how ONI worked almost immediately uh, and uh, designed it for automation. The, the glue code that ties a lot of these pieces together inside of ONI is simple shell scripting, so it was simple for people to understand and how to use it and how to write an operating system installer in this environment. It's very straightforward. And then some of the new ideas that we added was the inclusion of metadata during network installs. So when ONI, and we'll get into this more in depth, but ONI sends up some metadata like the serial number or the hardware type when it's making requests so that uh, sophisticated operators can tailor the, uh, their inventory control systems and their operating systems provisioning together. Here's a brief timeline of how ONI sort of went from inception to where we are today. Um, in late 2012, uh, we brainstormed here at Cumulus Networks. There's Matt Peterson and Dustin Byford contributed a lot of great ideas along with the JR and Nolan. And we thought about what did we want? Well, we wanted it to be more modern. We wanted it to you know, be fast. We wanted it to be small. We wanted it to be pre-installed. Uh, Matt Peterson had this great vision of how 
you know, we wanted to have a DevOps person be able to walk up to a switch with their MacBook, plug in an Ethernet cable point to point, and be able to install a network operating system on the switch, never having to use a serial console. That was a big idea. And so we started to work on it. And in early 2013, we started to evangelize the idea with the par hardware partners. And they were skeptical at first. First off, you know, who's Cumulus? What's in it for Cumulus? How does Cumulus make money from Oni? And, and so that was a big misconception at the beginning. Oni is not a Cumulus thing. It's, a, it's an enabler of an ecosystem. It actually enables many operating system vendors to all compete in the same space. And so once hardware vendors sort of understood that idea that, that the ecosystem would be broadened and the markets would be opened up with Oni, they were all on board. Uh, in May 2013, I uh, performed a public demonstration of ONI at an open compute project engineering workshop that was held at MIT to a room full of people. And that was great. People really got it. This was right at the time when OCP first announced their uh, idea about getting into uh, networking. And a lot of people, the buzz was in the air, and a lot of people really understood, like, wow, this using ONI, we can really open up this ecosystem for network switches. Uh, later that summer in 2013, uh, the first products from the various hardware vendors became available and people could actually order them and get going with it. At that same time, the Open Compute Project began to incubate the, uh, the ONI project, which was great. And more recently, in, in June of this year, the project has been fully adopted by OCP. And so now the whole source code repository is on an Open Compute GitHub repository. It's on open compute uh, mailing lists and IRC channels. So here you can see a sampling of the hardware partners who have uh, who have adopted Oni for their platforms. Um, and there's more than what's on this slide, and more coming uh, pretty much every uh, couple of weeks. And here's a sampling of some software vendors who are creating ONI compatible uh, OS installers. Uh, it has a wide acceptance and it's growing all the time. As uh, ONI has moved on and matured with OCP, one of the bigger events that happened this year was the, that the Open Compute Project opened up an, a certification laboratory at the University of Texas in San Antonio to certify OCP hardware and other things. And so one of the things that they're going to do is certify hardware vendors' ONI implementations. Like one way you really know you've made it as a software project is when people want to start to standardize the project and build other things around it and on top of it. And so this is really awesome. So the UTSA is going to help certify ONI implementations that the hardware vendors have made. The core of ONI is available on GitHub that people can download and install and build, uh, but you still want to make sure that the core features and functionality all behave consistently across various hardware platforms, and that's what the UTSA laboratory is going to do. You know, we're developing test plans and test suites, uh, and this will, benefit, <clears throat> this will benefit everybody in the ecosystem. Hardware vendors like it because they'll be able to show that their hardware is ONI certified. OS vendors will, will like it because, well, they can target hardware platforms that they know are only certified. And end users will know that they can choose with confidence hardware and software that's been only certified. And it'll just in general improve the overall ecosystem and improve the quality of the, of the ONI project. Okay, now we're going to take a, a break to answer some of the questions that have come in during the the first part of this presentation. So Carrie, what do we got so far? Awesome, thanks Kurt. Um, we had a lot of great questions coming in from the audience. Um, first one, why did you give ONI to OCP? Well, that's a great question. Um, we really wanted to find a mature organization that could be the home for ONI because we definitely, it was not intended, it was never intended for ONI to be a cumulus thing, a cumulus property. The only way it made sense if it, as an ecosystem enabler was if uh, 
a compelling organization took ownership of it. And so it made a, a lot of sense for OCP and with, with their, we're morally aligned with our objectives of opening up hardware and opening up firmware in order to create a, a bare metal ecosystem. Awesome, okay. Um, installing new ONI, does it require, are we required to remove the operating system? Well, that really depends on what's on the switch when you when you get it at first. I mean, in the in the ideal case, ONI is already on the machine when as it leaves the factory, so the end user shouldn't have to be installing ONI directly. Um, excuse me. And ONI compatible installers, they do, and we'll get into this in the technical deep dive. ONI compatible installers do not erase ONI as part of the OS install process. Great. Um, have any commercial vendors expressed interest in ONI as a replacement for their own operating system loaders? That's a great question. I mean, I guess it depends who, who you consider commercial operating system vendors. Um, I haven't really heard of that yet. Um, I've heard rumors that that's true, and I, so I won't mention any uh, commercial products by name, but I haven't seen anything publicly. But I have seen a lot, I mean, those software vendors that we showed on this page, and also there's more on this. I think I saw Pika 8 recently announced that they were going to create an, uh, an ONI installer as well. So there is a growing support, and there are rumors that other uh, more bigger companies are also creating ONI compatible installers. Awesome. Uh, do you have any installations where people are using the software on an iSCSI switch used in a virtual environment to connect to block storage? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I have not heard of anybody doing that yet, uh, installing over iSCSI. Uh, most of these installs are happening using the, and we'll get into this in the technical deep dive, but using the Ethernet management console and uh, regular IP. Can you run this on a Raspberry Pi? Um, that would be fun. Um, we can't do that yet, though support for ARM is going to be coming later this year. Uh, one thing that people can do is they can download the software from the GitHub repository and run it on an x86 virtual machine, which is a great way to download it and try it out. You say you do not require serial console and that everything can be done using the Ethernet port. Can everything also be done from the serial console or is it limited? Uh, the serial console is still there. Um, we try not to use it. Um, it's only used for accessing the CLI, however. You, for example, you can't use it to download an image to the switch. Great. I really want to try ONI and Cumulus Linux on top of it. I'm not a hardware or software vendor employee, but I have few Trident plus PowerPC based switches. Is there any way to install ONI? Um, yes, it depends on your hardware platform um, because ONI does have a small hardware platform dependent piece. Um, your best bet would be to uh, shoot me an email after this or check out the ONI GitHub repository and look in the machine directory and see if the, the platforms you have are supported. I recently purchased a few bare metal switches and ONI was already, already installed. Was I lucky or was that the idea? Um, well, I would say both. Um, you're lucky that you live in a time where ONI exists. And also, uh, that is the point. The idea is that uh, you, you buy a bare metal switch and it comes with ONI on it. And so that opens up the ecosystem and it, it should become a common technology across all of their metal switches. Um, how will ONI be distributed on the switch? Is it going to be burned into some uh, NVRAM? If so, what's the footprint? Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, ONI has to live somewhere. It is burned into the switch. Uh, a little bit, where exactly depends a little bit on the hardware platform as they all are a little bit different. But in general, it's stored in some non-volatile flash memory on the machine. Um, the footprint um, on a PowerPC machine is, a, is under four megabytes. Um, on x86 machines, it has grown a bit to include more utilities and is around 10 megabytes. And last question. You mentioned the inventory capabilities, Boney. Would this not be the same as getting the FRU data via IPMI as most servers today have a BMC integrated? Um, 
you know, that's it's similar, I would say. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same. Um, you still have to have, and we'll get into the technical details here, um, but ONI sends up those uh, the FRU information, the serial numbers and whatnot, during the, the dis image discovery process. And so I think there probably is some similarities there. Um, I haven't, I've yet to see a network switch that has IPMI on it. So we're doing, so ONI is providing a similar function, but over the Ethernet management console. Okay, Carrie, great. Thanks for the questions. Um, with that, let's move on to the uh, technical deep dive. We'll get more into how ONI actually functions and operates. So we've talked a bit about this before, but it's based on Linux, on the Linux kernel and, and BusyBox for the shell and the command line interfaces. Uh, the Linux kernel is awesome because it gives us networking and disk drives and file systems and various other device drivers, uh, everything that we need from a, for an OS install environment. Um, there's a few state machines that are used to manage the network interfaces and, and image discovery methods. And then shell scripting is the, uh, the programming language, if you will, of the ONI environment. So it's very easy to write a network OS installer in terms of a shell script. Again, we were trying to keep it small, and BusyBox comes with a very nice shell script interpreter that works just fine. It's very powerful. Um, we didn't have a lot of space for more advanced things like using Python or Perl to, uh, to implement uh, installers. So here's my cartoon drawing of uh, what a network switch looks like from a hardware perspective. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, there's the CPU root complex where you have some DRAM, maybe some boot flash, some mass storage device. And then connected to the CPU complex over PCIe, you have the switching ASIC, the data plane, if you will. That's where the, the 10 gig ports and the 40 gig port, ports are. And along the bottom, connected to the uh, CPU root complex, we have the, the management interfaces like the, uh, the serial console and the Ethernet management port. Those are the key pieces of the switch. Now, from ONI's perspective, we only use the left-hand side and the management interfaces. We don't do anything with the switching ASIC. So what does that mean? Uh, that means we do not perform network installations via the, the data plane. Uh, we'll focus solely on the uh, Ethernet management port and serial console if necessary. Um, <clears throat> part of the reason for that is the uh, there is a lot of software, SDKs and uh, and uh, NDAs and various legal issues surrounding uh, the switching silicon. And so the, if we went down that road, ONI would have to include a very large SDK um, and the uh, the legal issue, issues get somewhat thorny. Whereas focusing solely on the CPU complex and performing installs over the Ethernet management port is a, a much smaller solution and uh, easier to handle. So here's the flow of how the machine boots up for the first time. Um, it's fresh from the factory. The only thing installed on it is ONI. Uh, so what happens is the CPU starts up, it starts fetching instructions from some flash memory where the bootloader lives. The bootloader comes up and it does the typical BIOS-like things, or it could be a BIOS, could be U-boot. Uh, it configures the CPU complex, like the, the DRAM, the memory controller, initializes uh, Ethernet interfaces, and then it locates, loads, and boots ONI. And remember, ONI is just a Linux kernel with an init RAM FS, and so it's just like booting an operating system. So when ONI starts up, the kernel boots, it configures the Ethernet management interface, perhaps using DHCP or some static, statically defined IP addresses. Uh, it then enters an image discovery process where it tries to search out on the network for an image, an OS installer for it to execute. And it also, so then it goes and fetches the OS installer. The OS installer is downloaded and then ONI executes the installer. And so an OS installer, is sim you can think of it in very simple terms. It might be a, a tarball that contains a script. 
and that script runs and it unpackages the operating system and invokes various uh, busy box command line utilities to to install the operating system it might format the hard drive and install file systems and make directories and copy things here and there and then when it's finished it sets a little bit of state in the ONI environment area so that on subsequent boots um, the operating system will load. So here's a picture of subsequent boots. And the note the thing to note here is that the bootloader is still there. ONI is still there, but it's bypassed, and the boot process jumps straight to booting the network operating system. And after all, the whole point of the network switch is to run the network OS. It's not to run ONI. ONI is just there as an enabler. Another key thing to notice is that you know, ONI is, has not been removed. It's still laying latent there in the hardware so that it can be invoked again at a later time, perhaps to install a different operating system and uh, start over from scratch. So ONI remains on the box even after the network operating system has been installed. So here's a little bit more uh, detail on that image discovery process I talked about earlier. So as ONI's booting up, it uses DHCP v4 or v6 to configure the network interface, that management interface with an IPv4 and IPv6 address. And then it determines the location of an installer executable by examining various things. If there's a, a USB plugged in, It'll search that drive for a, a well-known file image, installer image file name. It finds it, it'll run it. It uses uh, more complex DHCP options and DNS service discovery methods to try and find an image. And we'll get into the details a bit more in a bit. Or it can do some simple point-to-point -point, uh, uh, searching for images over IPv6 nearest neighbors. And the point is, once it finds an image, it'll pull down that image and execute it and allow that installer to perform its job. So here are some of the waterfall methods that uh, ONI uses as it's going through looking for an image. We start with very specific uh, methods, and we, we roll back to, uh, we fall back to more loosely coupled methods. So the first waterfall is how do we configure the management interface? Well, we use IPv6 network discovery. We use DHCP v4. If that fails, we fall back to a well-known, well-documented IP address, very similar to how your home router works. You know, when you read the instructions, it says connect to 192.168.1.10. You know, we use, do a similar thing as a fallback mechanism. But clearly, in an automated case, you would use DHCP for all these things. Next, uh, we, there's a waterfall trying to locate an OS installer image. Uh, we can look on the local USB for a file that has a particular file name search. That's outlined there in number three. And we start from longest names, more specific names, down to less specific names. For example, it might be ONI installer dash power PC dash vendor or ONI installer dash vendor. And finally, we would try simply ONI installer on the root of the web server that's locally attached. And the, the big thing about using a HTTP request, this is where we really stepped up with the mo more modern approach. Um, as most of you are probably aware of, the HTTP protocol allows for headers to be sent when you make a, a GET request. And so we add some of the metadata to the GET requests so that a, a web server on the far end can look at these headers as uh, ONI is making requests and determine, oh, yes, this is a, a PowerPC machine, this is an x86 machine, uh, this is the serial number of the box, this is the MAC address of the box. 
and a sophisticated operator can use those to to uh, engage their uh, inventory control systems and operate things from all the way from front to back, from the loading dock to the rack. Everything can be tracked, managed, and accounted for. So here's a, an example of what the uh, installer mode grub menu looks like. Normally you wouldn't see this. This is all happening on the serial console. But here you can see it's set up for the install process. And so this is uh, clearly how for an x86 based switch and ONI will boot up in installer mode and it will go through that image discovery process. Here we see uh, the ONI kernel booting up and in installer mode. And there's a lot of interesting things going on here. Uh, first off, we can see that we're using DHCP in the MAC address to find uh, an IPv6, IPv4 address for ETH0, that's the 10.42.0.32. Uh, we see the drop bear SSH daemon is being started, and that drop bear is just an embedded SSHD, and also Telnet D is being started. And those are there to allow for remote debugging of the box over the Ethernet console. Again, we don't want to use the serial console, we want to rely on the Ethernet console. And so those those daemons coming up helps facilitate remote debugging. And then finally, we see that we are running an installer mode, and it's going to look for an installer. This screen shows a, a sample of some of the waterfall from a log file. So we get more of a feel for what's happening and how ONI tries to find things using well-known file names and uh, image discovery. In this case, the first few lines there are only going through its HTTP waterfall for an IPv4 address. And you can see it first tries a very long name, the complete ONI installer name, x86 Dell S6000 S1220, which is a very specific machine. And, and then it goes through shorter and shorter names. It chops off the x86 part, it chops off the Dell part, and finally it says, is there an ONI installer on that web server? And so that's a bit about how the waterfall is going. Um, next, you see uh, that uh, an IPv6 waterfall. It's very similar to the IPv4 waterfall, but it's using IPv6. And this is using the link local IPv6 nearest neighbor address. And so you don't even need a DHCP server for this to work. You can just plug it into a MacBook and you can install an operating system. And finally, the last uh, eight lines or so shows a, a TFTP waterfall using the classic uh, Pixie-like waterfall. You can see it's based on the, the MAC address of the machine and then also the IPv4 address chopping off uh, a, a nibble of the IP address on each iteration. And the point here is if you have an existing Pixie infrastructure up and going, uh, introducing ONI into that environment is very straightforward. You already have all the pieces that you need. There's not a whole lot new. And for those that don't have a Pixie infrastructure set up and going, in the ONI software repository, there's a contributed, uh, what we call an ONI server. It's just a very simple HTTP and DHCP server implemented in Python. So it's portable. You can fire it up on a Windows machine and on, or on a Linux machine. And it can you can use it to serve up uh, network operating system images. Here's a little bit more detail about those HTTP headers that I alluded to earlier. On the wire, you can see this metadata is happening. This was just captured using a, a TCP dump on the wire during an ONI install. And it's, it's much more powerful than a simple FTP or TFTP request. You can see these headers. You can see the serial number, the MAC address, the vendor ID, the machine type, and so on. Now, you could imagine that the backend web server where this is being served from, instead of it, uh, instead of the URL being uh, a simple, a static uh, path to the actual OS installer, perhaps it's a CGI script. So that CGI script can have a lot of intelligence in it. It can look at these headers plus other information 
and synthesize what exact operating system and what operating system version to hand back to this particular machine during the provisioning process. And then, once the provisioning process is complete, that script could tie together other information in a back-end inventory control database to, to help people manage what versions of which OS are installed on which machines in their data center. And so that whole process from the machine arriving on the loading dock in a cardboard box where a dock worker scans it with a, you know, a US, with a USB scanner and scans the barcode and you know, first primes the database all the way to where it's racked and where the OS is, is installed, all of that can be managed and automated, which is a, a very powerful thing as data centers get larger and larger. Here are some other behaviors that, um, that ONI does. We've alluded to most of these already. Um, clearly, there's the install process when it first ships from the factory, but you can also go back and re go into a reinstall mode to reinstall an operating system. You could uninstall and wipe a box clean. You can boot into a rescue mode whereby you get the ONI prompt, you get the Linux kernel and all the command line utilities, but it's not running the installer. And this you could use to poke around and potentially fix something that had inadvertently broken with your current OS install. It's a bit of a Swiss Army knife there. Uh, there's also an update mode where, in the case where ONI itself needs to be updated, we can use the update mode to push out an ONI update very similar and using the same methods as an operating system installer. So we can use the same DHCP waterfall infrastructure methods to push out an ONI update to a wide to a wide swath of uh, switches if we ever needed to push out a large a large patch in the field. And finally, uh, there's a something that's been happening this last six months or so is the desire to for ONI to include some diagnostics capabilities. And this is really up to the hardware vendors installing their their uh, hardware diagnostics. But what's really nice here is that a an end customer could uh, run the hardware vendor's diagnostic image and help troubleshoot um, problems that they're having. So, you know, before you go all the way to making the RMA, you could run the hardware diagnostics and see, well, is the hardware broken or is it really software misconfiguration or something of that kind. So end users will really benefit quite a lot from having that uh, diagnostic capability. And that's coming on strong this year. So where are we with a uh, current ongoing ONI development? Well, uh, we support PowerPC and x86 today. Uh, there's the x86 virtual machine, which you can use to uh, download ONI and try it out and put it through its paces and help set up your DHCP and TFTP and HTTP environments and make sure you have all that ironed out before your actual hard physical hardware arrives. Um, on the horizon, we also are planning support for ARM CPUs and MIPS CPUs. I expect to see ARM showing up before the end of 2014. Uh, we were at a an OCP uh, workshop at the University of New Hampshire last month where the discussion turned towards having a, a an inexpensive um, out-of-band IPMI switch. And a lot of the low-end boxes that are capable and fit, hit the price point are ARM-based today. And so it seems like ONI will be, uh, be running on an ARM platform any day now. Uh, and the main thing what we want to push across as we add more CPU architectures is to maintain the ONI behaviors because that's the important thing to the end user and also to the OS installers. We want ONI to behave the same on these different boxes, different CPU types, so that things remain smooth and consistent. Okay, here are some, as we wrap up, here are some final resources about ONI. Uh, there's the main the main page. There's a wiki on the OCP website. The source code is there on GitHub. Lots of documentation. Also, the design spec is out there. There's a mailing list where we discuss ONI events and send patches and active ONI development happens there. 
Uh, we have some blogs about ONI, and also you can hit us up on Twitter at, you know, at Project ONI, or you can tweet me at, at Kurt Bruni uh, with any kinds of questions. All right, let's see. So, did we have any uh, questions throughout the uh, actually, yeah, I think the latter half. <laughs> lots of lots of great questions coming in. Um, quite a few great questions, actually. Really, does Oni look for any specific packaging like ISO, RPM, or BIN? Uh, uh, no, it does not. Uh, the OS installer that Oni downloads, all it assumes is that it's executable. So it simply downloads it. Um, in Linux speak, it does a change mod plus X and then runs it. So it doesn't look for any particular type of image formatting other than that it's executable. Perfect. Um, does network, does the network, or once the network operating system is up and running, who manages the interface that ONI retains or that the network operating system can get control of? I, I kind of see where they're going with that question. Um, once the uh, network operating system is up and running, it's in control of everything. I mean, back on that one earlier page to show, showing this uh, on subsequent reboots, the bootloader <clears throat> vectors straight into the network operating system. And at that point, the network operating system is in charge of the Ethernet management port. Great. And is there existing ONI compatible products using x86? Um, yes, there are. Um, back on that hardware vendor page, I don't have their part numbers handy, but every single one of these hardware vendors has an x86 product that I have seen. So that is, it's definitely happening. x86 is pretty much here to stay. Great. And will ONI behavior change for Intel versus PowerPC platform switch? Um, not much. Um, the questions really are about where does ONI live on the different platforms, and we try to squeeze that off into one little corner so that most folks don't have to worry about it. Um, so the answer is no. The behaviors are pretty much the same. You have install mode, rescue mode, uh, uninstall mode. Uh, it's pretty much the same. Great. And who decided where to, to install NOS, either in SSD, SD, or NAND flash? Ah, a lot of that is dictated by the hardware platform itself. Uh, on x86, it's all pretty straightforward because most of these platforms are like a server in that, that there's some sort of SATA device on the inside, typically mSATA, but you know you can just think of it as a hard drive and that's where you install the operating system. On the other CPU architectures, things are a little bit more varied. Uh, you have NOR flash and you have NAND flash. Uh, some of them may include an SD card or maybe a compact flash card or some sort of an embedded USB. And so there, you know, it really is dictated by the, the hardware platform where things go. Great. And would it make sense to chain load this onto servers via Pixie, Pixie to Oni? Does it, it seems like Oni is a potential replacement for iPixie. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, that is part of a... Uh, I mean, if ONI is going to be running on servers, we'll see. There has been some interest about that. And definitely, ONI offers a lot of similar capabilities to iPixie. And in addition, it adds a lot of more, more uh, features for helping automation in the Megascale data center, especially that addition of the metadata to the HTTP headers during the image discovery process. I think that's a big win. And also the fact that based on Linux, um, this gives it a huge leg up because the device driver support is so much more, more mature there. Um, and just a few more questions. What are the constraints or requirements imposed on a hardware design and hardware vendor to support ONI out of the box? Ah, for a hardware vendor. Well, uh, there, there has to be enough storage space for ONI to reside. That's one. Um, and also, they need to step up and implement the ONI um, themselves and maintain it. And so based on, based on the core ONI software that's available on GitHub, they can create, a, they need to create a machine configuration file and include any device drivers or, or what have you that is required by their hardware platform. 
and maintain it themselves and then install ONI on the box themselves and help uh, you know and maintain it. Uh, it's really I think we've, we've gotten over the hump with that part so far. Um, at the beginnings we had a few hiccups you know and and uh, we helped people get get started and get rolling but now all the hardware partners really have a, have a very good grasp of what's needed to be done. Great. Um, what is the plan supporting ONI for ARM CPU? Ah, yeah, I just had touched that on the end there, but uh, definitely by the end of 2014, we'll see ARM support incorporated into ONI because yeah, that's a, that's an up and coming CPU architecture, especially on the on the lower, uh, the l less expensive uh, switches that are starting to be requested. Great. And final question. Are network operating system software upgrades handled by normal software operating system vendor methods or via ONI? Okay, uh, yeah, the ONI is not involved with the network OS upgrades themselves. It's, um, ONI is invoked when installing the network operating system in the first place. Um, as far as upgrades go, that would be up to the network operating system. Um, you know, just like if it was a, a, a Red Hat based network OS, you would use YUM and RPMs, and if it was Debian based, you would use APT get update and such and things like that. If it's a different type of OS, you know, it still would be up to the network operating system to manage the upgrades. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kurt. We're actually out of time now. Um, thank you, everyone, for your participation. We hope you found this presentation about ONI useful, and we'd love to have you turn into our tune into our next webinars. Um, and you can find details for any upcoming webinars on our webinars page, cumulusnetworks.com/webinars. Thank you all for your time today.